everything all together before uh, things start getting wild. And so somebody said in the prayer room, are these supposed to be handed out? Um, what, what am I supposed to do with them? Hand them out? Or set them somewhere? Okay, thanks, Dan. All right, and Rich, if I could have my own mic, uh, if I could have my own stand, that'd be awesome. No, no, I got it now, but in the future. A picture of my face out here would be preferable. Okay. Amen. Okay, well, we'll get you more. We'll get you whatever you like. Okay, so there were so many good things. You know, I don't know why you guys don't get all get closer <laughs> during times like this. It doesn't... I really don't get it. So what I am going to do today is I'm going to go up and down the aisles, I guess. <laughs> so I'll start up here. You, you guys know that the smarter people always sit in front. I mean, it's a statistic. I don't know. Come on. Gee, <laughs> many Christmas. Unless they're in the sound booth. That's a totally different ball game. Okay. Well, good stuff already. Um, you know, the thing of it is, just, just remember and just know that if you've ever been to, and I said this before, but I want, you to, I want to reiterate it, if you've been to uh, Benny Hen meetings, you know that all the healing takes place before he gets there. See, people don't know that. People think, oh, Benny, the healer, he does this and that. No. He just basically gives all the testimonies. But he's up in his room praying, usually for about eight hours prior to. He isolates himself uh, from everybody and gets up there and praying. So we were in line one of those times years ago, and there's just the line is long, and people are getting healed in line. Just all of a sudden, miraculous things take in line in expectation of. Then you go into the meeting, and you just worship, I think, I can't remember now, but maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half. I can't remember how long we worship. And that's when all the healings took place. And then when he came out, we sang a few more songs, and then people just came up and gave their testimonies of the fact that God had healed them while they were worshiping. I mean, so we're, we're down there with friends, and we're just praising the Lord and just people behind us going, thank you, Lord. Thank you for that touch. You've healed me. And I mean, they're just completely free. Some guys had casts or braces on their arms in line like this, you know, and, and afterwards, after the praise, it was all gone. It was just, it, there was just miracle after miracle. So real, the real deal, God does these things. And I, and I started thinking that so much of it was that these people are expecting. They're expecting. That's why they're coming. Whether that's believing in the man, believing in God, but they're coming to receive a miracle. Their faith level is high. Now, I, uh, this was a funny week. Number one, my wife is gone. So that makes it hilarious. And the other thing, just so many things happening. We're trying to get prepared here. And look at half the people are gone. And we're expecting to be preaching to full capacity. We're getting ready to put screens in the other building for the overflow section. Yeah. Which, as of right now, we don't need anything, right? We don't even need these screens here. We could all bunch up and have a little Bible study. <laughs> but we're anticipating. 
what God's going to do. Now, the enemy wants to come always and poo-poo whatever you think God's telling you. That's all he wants to do. He just wants to rain on your parade. And it's not the kind of rain we're looking for. He just wants you just to feel, oh, no, I miss God. Oh, no, now what have I done? Oh, I'm such a miserable sinner. And oh, all this stuff. And I began to think. And then uh, Emily came over. I can't remember when it was, a couple days ago. We were having coffee. And it was very nice. And we were talking about mature and immature people. And I'm complaining. I'm going, gosh, people are so immature. And these Christians, and they think they are mature. You know, because they walk around in their house and go, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Lord. And that makes you mature. It doesn't make you mature. It helps. Praising, worshiping, praying, it all makes, it all helps. And so I'm going, that's good, Emily. So I put a whole sermon together on maturing. And then I'm going the next day, I go, I don't know. Somebody else said something else to me. And I go, that's good. And I put a whole message together for that too. (laughs) And then yesterday I go, Lord, I need to get your mind. These are good, but they don't feel right. Give me another message. And I spent the, a half of the week just oh, that's good God that's good that's good man I feel like I'm so full having fun in the things of God you know I never worry about having the right message because I know if you don't receive whatever it is you're wrong <laughs> isn't, that a, isn't that a great way to be don't you wish you were me <laughs> Trust me, you don't want to be me. (laughs) So I started thinking, Lord, you showed me one time when I was not happy. And it wasn't wasn't that I wasn't happy. When we moved up to Big Bear, we came here, literally, we already had a house here, Michelle and I. And we're just kids, mind you, kids, kids. But I had done well financially. And so we came really for me to dry out, get away from drinking and all that. And I, and, and I still struggled for years. I stopped with the drugs and stuff. My last time was New Year's 1980. And I think we, I got saved in 78. And uh, we moved here, bought our house here in 78. And we moved here in 79. Uh, but I was still really struggling. and. But I was always a, really a happy person, whether I was high, not high, had money or had no money. It, none of it mattered to me. And then this whole new revelation of being clothed in Christ's righteousness, knowing that Jesus is the Messiah, and all these things started just piling up on me in just a really wonderful way. And then God began to reveal things to me. And so the revealing and revelation that he was showing me was just absolutely awesome. But a lot of it was from the Old Testament going through the Israelites and entering into the promised land, not entering into the promised land, and then actually entering into the promised land. And so I had been working commercial down the hill prior to 79. And we got up here and I thought, this is such a podunk place. This is, these are all brain dead people. This, did anybody go to school? You know, I thought this is just strange. And uh, I really struggled. I'm not making any money at all. I'm working 10 hours a day to get maybe five hours of work in because back then, in the end of the 70s, it seemed like it'd snow every, at least three times a week. You never could get ahead of this thing. I mean, you had to cover up all your material, stake it off with six-foot stakes, and now you know where you can find it. We'd spend hours shoveling out. And this was every day, 10 hours to get five or six hours worth of pay in. I go, this is ridiculous. 
There has got to be a better way. So I'm driving my 63 VW over to the Hamilton Estates, which was nothing then. I told you this before, but I, I want to reiterate it for a reason. And I'm complaining. I'm saying, God, I'd really like to move, but I want to be submitted to you. And I'm just young and dumb in the things of the Lord, but I know he's God. Yeah. I know he's God, and I know there is a God, and I know he's there. I know he loves me, cares for me. I know those things. D did not deserve any of it, learning about redemption and learning about him his righteousness. What a blast. And then he just filed very softly, just said, this is your promised land, John. Right here is your promised land. So that was probably in, I don't know, maybe 80, maybe 82, 81 could have been. So this is my promised land. Now, mind you, in living in the promised land, oftentimes it did not feel like the promised land. Now, the difference between the wilderness and the promised land can be one is, one is truly the potential of God's will, and one is definitely not God's will. God does not want you wandering around in the desert. But if you decided to build a condo in the desert, and you found those streams, of life in the desert, you could be reasonably comfortable in the desert. Likewise, you can live in promised land living, live in the promised land. This is, we've moved in, we fought the fight, we're now here, but you don't enjoy any of it. It's there. The grapes are there. Everything God said is there, but for whatever reason, you're not enjoying it. And it reminded me of Joshua 18. And that's when they, they go into the promised land. They cross over. They're moving in. Five of the tribes had taken their possessions. Seven of them in the promised land did not. And we all sit there and think, Wow, that's kind of silly. But I wonder, how many of us, we understand the difference between the wilderness and the promised land, yet we're not living promised land living to its fullest extent. So let's find Joshua. Genesis, Exodus, Joshua. Okay, right after Deuteronomy. <coughs> And then I compiled, I told you, three messages totaling 78 pages of notes. So I'm going to use some of them today, if everything goes well. Okay. All right. In verse 1, in chapter 18 of Joshua... Verse 1 and verse 2. So the whole assembly of the Israelites gathered at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. So they're going to have a meeting. The country was brought under their control. But there were still seven Israelite tribes who had not yet received their inheritance. So as the children of Israel finally begin to take possession of of their inheritance. Now these are key words. Possession, inheritance. We find that there are seven tribes that for some reason have failed to receive their inheritance. Okay? Just be thinking about these things. And I believe that the same problem exists today in the church. Many of God's people who are living substandard lives because they haven't taken hold of the promises of God. I mean, the benefits, I don't like using that word, but since it's used in the scriptures, I'll use it. There are benefits that come along with salvation. I mean, if you were to adopt a child, we've, we've taken in a number of kids into our household over the years, 
And when they were in our household, I treated them like my kids. Just like them. Because they were my kids. And I was going to give them everything I gave my kids. And that's what God does. He doesn't treat any of us differently. It's all there. But many have not received the inheritance for whatever reason. Now, your reasoning can be that you leave here and it just life goes on and it's too busy. Now, well, think about this. Now, I've always shared just a, some little things about my youth, but I had such a blast. So I, I have this 1960 hippie van, and I mean hippie van. And it is awesome. And I got one or two surfboards in there and a sleeping bag, and I am self-sufficient. Worked a couple days a week to pay for gas and a little bit of food because I didn't need to eat much back then. And it was wonderful, wonderful life. Sometimes I'd go to college in the morning. I would check surf report. By the time I got there, if the waves were pumping, I was gone. I remember sitting there with one of my friends who, I think he, he got a PhD in human factoring. If we were close friends. It's funny. I mean, human factoring is a part of psychology where it's not a matter of manipulating people, but you indirectly, it, it's, it's understanding human behavior, okay? That uh, if you do this, they'll do something. If you do this, they'll do that. So in the workplace, they did this little experiment. And so they, they changed the music every week. And they, in the workplace, there's 200 employees. And they went from soft music. At the end, it was acid rock. <laughs> and every time there was a change, the people worked more, harder. <laughs> it didn't have anything to do with how it changed. It just was the fact that there was some change, and they worked harder. I mean, it was an interesting study. I don't even know if it's still applicable. But change that just all of a sudden stimulated all this kind of uh, activity. In our inheritance, so, uh, wait a minute, so, so back in those days, I, I knew freedom like you can't believe. It was wonderful. Free. I mean, just to go anywhere you wanted to go. There's no pressure. There's nobody yelling at you. You're just enjoying life. It was the wilderness, for sure. But there was a part of it that I was away from everything that was evil and all the <coughs> crummy stuff, well, mostly anyways. And it was just, it, was, it worked out okay for me. It didn't work out okay for everybody. <coughs> but then I got saved, and here all of a sudden, I'm going from having a wonderful, great life, Michelle and I together towards the end of this, having a blast, into now we are saved, and we're feeling that we are finally complete. There's a completeness that came. You gotta remember, we traveled all around the world. And me, I'm looking for God. I know there's a God. I'm gonna find him. All around the world. The things that happened during that journey would just crack you up. God maneuvering us all over the place, finally realizing something about it that was totally wrong. We got a revelation. This is what God wants us to do. We found it. What a mistake. Didn't work out right. And then when we moved to Arizona on a job, it all came together. And it was the most simplest thing. This, we go to this Bible study set up by an angel too much. I can't do that right now. And we get to the Bible study, and I asked the pastor there, maybe 12 people in the room. I said, I heard that person said over there that she was born again, and she looked really happy. Now, now think about this. Don't tell me that your countenance doesn't make a difference in somebody else's life. It was because of this girl that was going through some real challenges crying on the phone, her parents were hating her, something bad was happening, and I'm sitting in with Michelle, and we're listening to half the conversation, and 
she goes, she hangs up the phone, turns around, puts a smile on her face like you can't believe. Like, Lord, you've got this. I'm going to serve you. I'm putting this behind, and right now we're going to enter into worship. I'm watching her. And then um, we had talked to her for a second. She said she was born again, listening. And then I went to the pastor, and I said, I don't know what's going on here. Now, you've got to remember, at this time, I have a degree in religious studies. I am not a knucklehead. I, I do, went to the Graduate Theological Union of Berkeley. Theological Union. I only made it one semester, but it was powerful. It was, it was really impactful later on down the road. But I looked at this girl, and I told the pastor, and this is what the pastor said. He said, well, do you believe in Jesus? I said, absolutely. He goes, do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? I said, of course I do. He said, you're saved. He says, you're born again when you believe. And that's when I sat there, and all these things just tumbled in on my mind. And it was that thing that I've said many times about Dr. Douglas, who said that, you'll, that an altered state of consciousness, John, is knowing that Christ is the Messiah. And I experienced that right on the spot, that altered state of consciousness, because I knew what this guy is saying, that Jesus is the Messiah, but because he was the Messiah, there's this, this, and this. He forgave me of my sins, and it opens the door to all these scriptures that I had read that didn't think anything about it because I was reading the Logos. And then it became Rhema in my spirit, and I'm going, wow. All because of the countenance on one girl's face. Think about that. And we have an opportunity all the time with this thing. People, oh, I got to minister, I got to do this, I got to do this. Sometimes all you need to do is just be you and smile. Knowing that you're going through the storms and that life is not easy, but you know, know also that God has this. God's got it. One thing that I got from, not the one of many, from John Ackerman, spending time with him with these little things he'd come up with when he, during times when he was struggling. All of a sudden he'd stop and he goes, no, John. He goes, God's got it. He said it with authority. God's got it. And that's exactly right. And you want to lift, you want to get some stuff just lifted off of you? Just say to yourself, hang on. Yeah. Whatever your name is, hang on. <clears throat> hang on, John. God's got this. I, I, had, I had one of these ex experiences just uh, over the last month. I thought, oh boy, this is going on, this situation. I'm not quite sure what to do. And I go, remember the words of John A. That was that little voice. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. Why am I doing this? This was like when Eric came over because I was panicking years ago. I, I was just, I thought, I, literally, I thought I was going to die. That's what I thought. And Eric comes over, Dr. Johnson, as a doctor and a friend. He couldn't do anything for me as a doctor because there was nothing to be done. He said, John, just, he, he goes, just give it to Jesus. I mean, that's what you do, right? Well, that's what I'm supposed to be doing, yeah. It was like the same time when Pastor Jeff, I was going through a difficult time in the early 80s, and Pastor Jeff said, well, you, I, I got the answer for you. I'm getting counseling from this guy. Don't let me forget, but incidentally, Pastor Jeff's coming on November 7th, and Pastor Mike, and so it's going to be a home, little, a nice little home week thing cool. for all of us. Yeah, yeah. Cool. and I told him about the, I had a dream, that uh, dream maybe a year ago, uh, and I told Pastor Jeff yesterday that we were all up here, here, and we were circled around. Back in the old days, we'd have presbytery meetings. Apostles and prophets would come to town, and then you guys would pray and fast, and then they would call people up, and man, they would just surround you and prophesy. And just, it, was, it was so powerful. And that's when I first got to spend time with Apostle Fox, 
when he said, John, he said, you just come and stand by me. I mean, I'm a nobody, in I'm, I'm the door monitor. That's, the, that's my position. He says, but he saw something that I didn't know existed in me. And he said, you come, he goes, and you just stand by me and just be a part of, just standing, just listen, don't talk. These guys are all huddled up, all these prophets, and the, you know, there's four or five, and they're all in a big huddle like this, you know, and they're doing the shondos and everything. And, man, I just feel the presence of the Lord just so strong. And that's what I saw. I saw this circle, and there was three or four guys there. And it, what it reminded me, because Mark Johnson was one of them. Now, you guys don't know Mark Johnson. For the, or a few of you know Mark Johnson. He's Forerunner Ministries. And he's been, he's been a frontliner forever, and we fellowshiped with him up here for about six years, long time ago. And he's a hardcore street ministry guy. And he comes out once a year, and he comes over to our house for dinner, usually on the Sunday night. And so he comes, and I told Mark, I said, Mark, I said it was just so awesome. I said, you were standing there, Pastor Mike was over there. Pastor Jeff was there, and I, and I thought A.L. was there, but I, I couldn't honestly remember. And I said, and we, and I'm in there this time. We're huddling up. And then all of a sudden, Jesus, this is the second part, I've never shared this with anybody. Jesus comes into the huddle. He's just there. We're like this. And then I'm looking, and I'm going, Jesus is here. And he's, he's standing over there. There's Jesus right there. He's going, <laughs> yeah. he's going yeah yeah and I'm going wow and he says so what's happening and I said I said well Lord we're just gonna we're just here to glorify you and to lift you up and and that's that's all we're here for and he says awesome he said listen I'm taking off then I'm going down the road he goes and I'm gonna jump in over there and see what they're doing he goes, you guys carry on. <laughs> Listen, as long as you're bringing glory to God, you carry on. Amen. If you feel that you're not bringing glory to God, then just slow down. Examine your ways. Amen. And let's get back on track. All right? Because a lot of stuff is going to be happening. A lot of fun stuff is going to be happening. And I was thinking about, I thought, you know, I told the Lord before, I said, I said, Lord, I'm ready. I've been ready for a long time. And I felt like I had to get this building ready and that building ready and all these things ready. And so many of you guys here have been working so hard on all this stuff. And um, I thank you for that, by the way. And it's just been awesome. But then we get here, and the button, the remote for that is gone. The remote for those things are up there are gone. And I thought, I still can't get it together. And then I said, what the? No. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. There are still things, some things, that we need to get together, that we need to get ready, okay? I feel like my heart's good. I feel like I'm ready. But there's still little things. There's little details. All right, who found them? Well, I gave it to you for a purpose. <laughs> the point is this. Are you going to let lights behind the cross bother you? No. I said, no way, God. It's not going to bother me. What about these party lights? I said, well, that bothers me a little bit. <laughs> no. no. You know what? It's not going to bother us. But we are going to be faced with these things. Is that going to bother you so that you can't minister? No, Lord. Huh? Yeah, carry on, will you? Get that, get that on, please. Nice, nice. 
Nice touch. Nice touch. Okay, so here we are, and we've got these guys that have just moved into the promised land, but they haven't, the seven of them haven't taken possession of their stuff. Now, the Bible specifically says that they have not received their inheritance. And so, me, I thought about, let me see. No, I got it written right here. I thought about Hebrews 12.1. And I, because I was thinking about that ready. Are we ready? And it says in 12.1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, who, who are those witnesses? Faith people that have come before us? The ones that, act, this is coming after 11, the faith chapter. And then it says, but let us throw off everything that hinders. And, and that reminds me of Barnabas, right? Because Barnabas took that old coat and he just threw it off. It was the old Barnabas. It was blind Barnabas. He threw that thing off. I'm done. It's over with. I'm throwing it off. It's just like Esau. Father, don't you have a blessing for me? Well, when you get fed up and tired with the way things have been, you're going to be able to throw it off also. Any of you sick and tired? Let us throw off everything that hinders. Can you think of anything that might hinder you outside of your spouse? <laughs> no, seriously. Outside of your spouse. I'll tell you, half of you will jump right to the spouse. It probably is a hinder, too. There's no doubt about it. That's not the point. Outside of that, can you think of anything that might be hindering you a little bit? And what would it be? And if you, can think of, if you can't think of something, come see me. I'll counsel with you. I'll, I'll show you. I'll make a list for you. You know, there's only one time that I ever got taken up on that. Never saw the guy in church again. I know. Let us throw up everything <laughs> that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles you. It's a funny thing. I got this net out there by, on my house because of the woodpeckers, right? And it entangles all those little tiny birds. But the woodpecker never gets entangled. He's too big. He's the one I'm trying to get. All these other ones, they get caught. The old woodpecker, you got to use a shotgun on him. <laughs> but don't let anybody see you. Everything that hinders, we're going to throw off. And the sin that so easily entangles you. Yes. Now, I got to tell you something personal. That I'm not much of a sinner anymore. I say dumb stuff, but I'm not into it. I'm into living right, doing right by people, and doing right by God. Amen. You know, so there's not a whole lot out there that's going to cause me to sin. You know, I don't know. I, it's just not, it's not my thing. But there is sin that so easily entangles us. And you would, based on what I just said, you're saying, well, pride, your sin. I go, <laughs> you know, I was so full of the spirit one day and I was picked up this, this wife, a wife called me and said can you get my husband he's in the bar and drunk and I said yeah I'll go get him so I get him and I put him in the car I'm taking him home and I'm preaching to him and he says to me man you know you need, you're just so self-righteous you just think you're God and you just think you're this and I'm sitting there going well, he's drunk. I can tell he's drunk now for sure. He knows me when he's not drunk, and he knows I'm not God, right? And he's going on and on and on, and he's drunk. He's out of his mind. Now, you could say, well, now he's speaking what's really in his heart. Wow. How many times I got called over to their house, 
because they're having a fight. I get to get, I get to come in with my Bible, read Scripture to them, and just and then just just line your life up here. Don't line your life up to me. I would never do that. Always point to the Word, and you don't have to worry. People will call you self-righteous because that's they they know that if they can get you somewhere, it's going to be there because everybody wants to be humble and, and walk in humility. Like I told Kevin, when we oh, over there and we, a number of people came and had a word for him, and I, I didn't finish it, but I, I might have mentioned it afterwards because I told him, because Kevin's, um, for the most part, a very mild and meek individual. And we were talking about lions that day. And I said to him afterwards, I said, don't mistake meekness for weakness, okay? Because meekness is not weak. There's, there's strength there. You being clothed in his righteousness is his righteousness. Don't let anybody say, well, that's self-righteousness. No, when you're telling somebody about his righteousness that you're clothed in and you're talking about you because you're clothed in him, that's a good thing. That's what you want. They can still call you self-righteous, and they will. It's okay. You know better. But what about that sin that easily, easily entangles you? What is it? You ever given it some thought? Is there something that easily entangles you? Stop right there. Get it out of your life. You know, when I was young, I loved drinking, I loved smoking. I think of all the bad habits, if, I could, if God would give me one bad habit, I would still smoke. I loved smoking. It just was... I mean, cup of coffee in the morning and a cigarette. What's better than that? Oh, man. Yeah. A lot. You ever kiss somebody that drank coffee and smoked cigarettes? <laughs> Whoa. Like kissing an ashtray? Oh, my God. That brings it all together, doesn't it? Right? Okay. I don't drink. I don't do those things. Do you know why? Because they easily entangled me. That's just one of the reasons. The other reasons is I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to be a good example to a certain extent, you know. You follow me as I follow Christ, amen? Okay? Yeah, I want to be that person. Well, man, you've got to toe the line if you're going to be that person. You just can't be in and out. You've got to toe the line. You've got to do the work. But God equips, doesn't he? It's the easiest thing in the world, being God's will and do what's right, because he's equipping you. If you're doing it in your own strength, you're making a huge mistake. You have your part to play, Yes. Oh, I can't get away from that. Let's go. Let us throw off everything that hinders you. I want you to think about it. What's hindering you from moving the chips all in? Now, just in the natural, just in the natural, what's hindering you from going a little bit further in your worship? What's hindering you there? I mean, when we would take the mission trips to Guatemala, those services would be three hours long. I think they'd have worship for an hour and a half. And if you weren't running around, you didn't know how to worship. It was the, most, it was the wildest thing I've ever seen. And one of the gals said, we need to bring this back home. And one of the other pastors there said, that ain't happening. <laughs> yeah, well... You know, I don't know. Maybe they thought they were running around in the flesh. I, I don't know. I mean, did anybody ever do the, see the Pensacola revival when they were going around doing the chicken thing? And half the people are going, oh, man, this is not God. This is the flesh. This is that. When you're going around as a chicken, it's really, it's not God. But when you're, when you're doing this, it's God, of course. I mean, there's a big difference between the two. I have no idea. 
I would not want to run around like a chicken and say, oh, God just got complete control of me. Well, suppose that God wanted to have some fun with you. You're the one that comes in with a coat and tie, your hair all perfect all the time, got your Gucci pants on, and all of a sudden, you're going in the front row. I think that would be just like God. I don't know. Does he do those things? I don't know. I guess we're going to find out, huh? Throw off the things that hinder you. Are you thinking about it? I mean, have you ever sat there, gone through this scripture, read it? Let me, let me read it to you in the uh, Passion. As for us, we have all of these great witnesses. That's, you know, for us, we have such wonderful mentors. And, and, and in our church, and we have so many powerful teachers and ministers and prophets. And, and for being a small church, we got it all. It's so impressive. I'm just so blown away. That's why I know God's going to do something big because he's, he's given us a, a foundation that's going to be awesome. And when it comes, it's going to be marvelous. I mean, we're going to see people getting saved, healed, and made whole. Nothing like being made whole after the world takes a bunch of pieces out of you for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. God comes and says, I'm going to make you whole. Yahoo. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. As for us, we have all these great witnesses. I don't know why I have 70 pages of notes. As for us, we have two scriptures, and that'll be plenty. We have all these great witnesses. Well, I think about that a lot. I, uh, I have a lot of great uh, witnesses, and they're my friends. And there are those that I fellowship with and stuff like that. I have a lot of those. And it's really wonderful. I look to them and I pray for them. And I marvel because they're so, they're, they're such anointed people of God. It's just, it's awesome. So we have these and who encircle us like a cloud. So those are the kind of people you want around you. Because they'll help you toe the line and stay straight and stay the course. Uh, then it says, so we must let go of every wound that has pierced us. See, that's a totally different way of saying it. We must let go every wound that has pierced. Have you ever been pierced and, and been wounded by someone? Huh? I think pretty much everybody has. Yeah, I mean, can you let it go? I just... I just have a hard time letting it go. I, you see, you've got to let it go. You've you got to let it go. And that's when we don't walk by faith or feelings, right? Neil and I were having this conversation just this last week. You know, just, and there's just things we have to let go. And, and sometimes, but I don't feel it. I keep thinking about that person. I never did like that person. I said I forgive him, but it doesn't feel like I forgive him because I still don't like him. Listen, listen, we don't walk by feelings. We walk by faith. We walk by this declaration as long as it's lining up with the word of God, that's the truth. The rest of it is not the truth. So we must go. Let go of every wound. Let it go that has pierced us. And the sin we so easily fall into. So that, that's a... One entangles you, like that woodpecker that was all entangled but escaped. One entangles you, but one makes you to fall. So it gets you in there, and then you fall. And the sin we so easily fall into. You see, whatever this easy to fall into thing is, you know it already. Why? Well, because it's easy. If it's easy to fall into, you've been doing it more than most. So whatever it is, let's stop it. Okay? You know, I wish that when we pray 
God would just make all of us perfect and ready for ministry for when the people come in and we're all on top at 100%. We're still going to pray that way, but we're going to have to get there. That scripture in Hebrews wasn't put in there because everything is perfect as saved people in the promised land. Everything is not perfect as saved people in the promised land. Everything can be made perfect as we continue to grow in Christ. Like, like what T Teresa said about the union, and, and many have said, when you're joined here, and we are joined, it's, it's, it's big. can anything be bigger than promised land living? That would be being joined to the promise Amen. and creator of all things. Amen. That would be it. But in that, I have everything? We're joined at the hip, at the, in the heart, just totally joined. In the spirit, we're joined. Everything's joined, joined. Does he have sin in his life? No, I don't think so. Does he have disease in his life? I don't think so. Does he have troubles in his life? I don't think so. These things come, but then how we respond is the key. Just remember that gal. I remember it today. She was probably 75 pounds overweight, young, obviously being challenged with a lot of stuff. The reason I heard that the phone, because she's in a pay phone, in a hallway, the door was open to the church, and I was sitting right there. It wasn't a church, it was a, somebody's room, or I can't remember. So I'm listening to this whole thing, weeping, crying. I know she's talking to her parents now, and hangs up. And she wipes the tears from her face, takes a big breath, smiles, and goes into the room. And then she gave a little testimony about two minutes long about how God is sustaining her, lifting her up in the midst of the difficulties and the trials. And she says, I am so glad I got born again. See, somebody in that family was upset because she got born again. That's the only thing I could figure out. And I thought, whatever that girl has, that's the one thing I'm missing in my life. And I wasn't missing anything. We had money, we had fun, we had all the natural stuff that you could have, and life was great. Oh, but there was one thing that I knew I needed to have. Man, I needed God inside me. I, needed, I knew because I knew he came into people. I had stuff coming into me, but it wasn't God, I can tell you that. But when that day came, yowser. So we must go. We must let go of every wound. Can you do that? Say, say right now, I let go. Father, I let go. Every wound that has pierced me. Father, I let go. Every word that has pierced me. Father, I let go. Every circumstance that has pierced me. It's gone. It's done. I let it go. I'm moving on. I'm moving on. That's a hallelujah. Hmm. Okay, then, and the sin we so easily fall into. So just, you know, if you need to pray because you're so holy that you can't think of anything, then pray. God will show you. But there, just, just say, Lord, if there is something out there that I've been falling into and I really don't realize it, then please reveal it to me. He will reveal it to you. You see, when we can get to that point in Galatians where we are free to be free to be free to be free, if you can ever get ready for ministry, you're ready. Because there's nothing hindering you. You know, if, there, if, if I had a problem with somebody before coming to church, I leave it outside. And I come in here and I say, God, I don't care what has happened to me during this week. This is your time. Amen. You get to use me. John is dead. Let's go, God. I'm not thinking about anything but you. Let's do this. Okay? But it's so much better if you've left that stuff out there months ago, never picked it up again, and you come prancing in. 
empty, you emptied yourself a long time ago and you didn't refill it with junk. You can do that. Life can be that wonderful. Amen. Get it all out. Empty. Fill it up with God and say, thank you, Jesus. This is my life. Gosh. You're good. I just did a Biden. Good, good, good. <laughs> if you can't handle jokes about Biden, you don't want to be here. <laughs> Probably where all those missing chairs are right there. Yeah. Now, then the last part of that, then we'll be able to run life's marathon race. Huh, I like that. It's not a sprint, is it? I mean, there's times when we sprint, but he identifies it as a marathon race. Before all these good versions came out, we always knew it was a marathon, and we'd plug that in there. And now these good versions come out and say, oh yeah, he was insinuating it was a marathon. And that's why you have to have, maybe in the Passion it says long haul faith somewhere. But we have five types of faith. I added the sixth one, which is what I call long haul faith. Which means I'm going to continue with God till the day I die. Amen. Period. None of you guys can upset me at all. Yeah. Nothing. Why? Because life's too short. See, I don't go home and I cry on Sundays and I go, oh man, geez, so-and-so said this and now I feel bad. I don't do that. Why? Because I have a purpose here. And you need to get this in your spirit. You can't impact people negatively. Don't do it. Don't be impacted by people negatively. Okay? Why? Life is too short. It's too short to waste any time dwelling on dumb stuff. A part of the mature Christian does not dwell on dumb stuff. Dwells on things that are lovely and pure and praiseworthy. I'm only going to dwell on things that are praiseworthy. Can you do that? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. I've run into Ron uh, a number of times. He's walking around. He reminds me of Moses every time I see him. He's got his staff. At one time he was... He was just walking, he turned for a second, this was a, probably a month ago, and the sun was just hitting him just right, and I'm going, wow! <laughs> Go, wow! Uh, wow, it was like that. <coughs> Moses is here at our church! <laughs> but, wow! It just, it's so amazing, but he just continues, and I'm going, wow! How wonderful this is to have somebody in the Spirit praying for you all the time, pr praying for your property, being mindful of you. It's a wonderful thing. Not thinking about anything else. But just thinking about the goodness of God. When we walk on this stuff, this dirt here that in this place that God gave us, we should only be thinking about the goodness of God. We shouldn't be thinking that the lights don't work or this is imperfect or whatever. But the goodness of God, we can do this now. We can do this at home. We can do this during the middle of the week. The goodness of God. Listen, the gates are getting ready to get open. They haven't opened yet. You're gonna, matter of fact, I told somebody in church, I won't mention any names, but I said, you know, I believe you're called to be a pastor and... Uh, person just said something I don't know uh, oh and but then we talked later and uh, and Michelle was there and said you operate as a pastor long before anyone you call yourself a pastor you, you automatically that's what you you do whatever you're called to do you, you, half the people don't even know what they're called to do. But they operate in it. And that's why for a pastor, it's so easy to see. Because I just, you can see the heart of, of what they're gravitating towards. And God's pushing them along. And it's just so wonderful to see, so fun, wonderful to witness. To operate in it. Okay, one more scripture. 
going to be verse 3, and then I'll quit. You know, I really appreciate you guys, you hardcore ones that let me go on past 12. It's 12.01. <laughs> Back in the old days, I was preaching 20-minute sermons because that's all the time I would get. I'd have to quit at 11.30, and half the time the, we'd start 10 minutes late, the worship would go on too long, and somebody would get up there and start babbling away, and I'd only get 20 minutes! And then Barnabas came all over me, and I threw the coat off. God, I don't care what you think. I'm done with that. Verse 3. Joshua says to the Israelites, how long will you wait before you begin to take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has given you? How long are you going to wait? Now, let me read that to you in just a couple other versions and then I'll quit. Chris, are you ready? I'm ready. Why are, if one version says, why are you so slow to go in and take up your inheritance in the land which, uh, land which the Lord, the God of your fathers has given you. You remember that time I told you I was called from a wife out meeting the husband. I say to the man who's doing drugs, just living poorly, not behaving himself at all. And I said, listen, I said, you got two choices here. You can, you can plug into the things of God, keep your wife, keep your kids. You can um, go down this road that you're going down right now, and you're going to lose your wife, you're going to lose your kids, you're going to lose everything, plus your job, probably end up in jail. Bad confession that I had over him, but it's kind of like I could see where things were going. And he sat there and he goes... I'm sitting there going, are we serious here? I'm asking you to choose life or death, literally. And you're struggling with the decision? How long? Why are you so slow to go in and take up your inheritance in this land? Can you imagine? Do you, do you think we're a little slow? Another one says, how long are you going to waste time conquering the land? Boy, we're in the fight. We're just fighting, fighting, fighting. That's all we're doing is fighting. How long are you going to waste time? Here's the last one that I'll finish. How long will you neglect to go to possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers has given you. Now, can you just kind of plug some things in there? Walking and living in the fullness of being joined to Jesus. See, we even have to define being joined to Jesus, and we have to experience it, and we have to know what does this mean to be joined and all he's saying is just, the word is true, let's live it, we have a job, let's do it together. I mean, can you imagine that little second part of the dream that I had? Jesus comes into the huddle. And because right there, and I'm going, Jesus has taken over this. I was going to say, Jesus, you preach, you take it over. You lay hands, you do it. I get goosebumps thinking about it. I mean, he's just going, he's just got this big old smile on his face. You guys, you guys got it. I'm here. You got the comforter. He's with you. I'm going down the next building. He goes, go for it. It doesn't mean he's not here. He's here. Right? But he's saying, go for it. You. It's your time. Amen. Step up to the plate. Do you ever dream about being up at the plate when there's three people on base 
and you hit the grand slam? You ever think about that? It's never going to happen if you don't step up to the plate. It's time for us to step up to the plate. Whatever it is he can do, that, he's, he'll be nudging us. Let's do it. I can prophesy something to you. I can tell you, and I'll just, I won't do it in the King James Version. I'm just going to tell you what's going to be. This area right here is going to be just so anointed that when people come up, some of them are just going to collapse. Some of them are just going to get healed. Some of them are just going to repent, and they're going to start confessing their sins because they are going to fall into God's presence. It's going to be so powerful. The wickedness is just going to go. It's just going to flee. And God's going to be glorified. Wow. I feel the presence of the Lord so strong. But I want you to feel it too. No, I want you to really feel it. Because when that time comes and we're praying for people, no dead weight, no sin that easily entangles you, no wound that we haven't taken care of. I know God can use anything, right? But he's saying, I'll heal you up so good, make you whole, and you're going to be a vessel for noble, not ignoble, for noble purposes. That all brings glory to the Lord. Give the Lord a praise, everybody. Woo!